Hello everybody, Mr. Wozniak back. We have September 14th. Today's reading is a little bit longer since we're covering the entire weekend. We have pages 49 through 66. So again, this is a weekend reading, so a little bit longer since we have a few days. Usually, Mac leaves after the last show, but tonight he is in his office working late. When he's done, he stomps my bind obeying and stares at me for a long time while he drinks from a brown bottle. George joins him, broom in hand, and Max says the thing he always says. How about that game last night? And business has been slow, but it'll get better, you'll see. And don't forget to empty the trash. Mac glances over at a picture Julia's drawing. What are you making? He asks. It's for my mom, Julia says. It's a flying dog. She holds up her drawing, eyeing it critically. She likes airplanes and dogs. Hmm, Mac murmurs, sounding unconvinced. He looks at George. How's the wife doing, anyway? About the same, George says. She has good days and bad days. Yeah, don't we all, Mac says. Mac starts to leave, then pauses. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a crumpled green bill, and presses it into George's hand. Here, Mac says with a shrug. Buy the kids some more crayons. Mac is all right at the door before George can you know, go, thanks! Stella, I say after Julia and her father go home, I can't sleep. Of course you can, she says. You're the king of sleepers. Shh, Bob says from his perch on my belly. I'm dreaming about chili fries. I'm tired, I say, but I'm not sleepy. What are you afraid of? Stella asks. I think for a while. It's hard to put into words. Gorillas are not complainers. We're dreamers, poets, philosophers, nap takers. Well, I don't know exactly. I kick in my tire swing. I think I may be a little tired of my domain. That's because it's a cage, Bob tells me. Bob is not always tactful. I know, Stella says. It's a very small domain. And you're a very big gorilla, Bob adds. Stella? I ask. Yes. I noticed you were limping more than usual today. Is your leg bothering you? Oh, just a little, Stella answers. I sigh. Bob resettles. His ears flick. He drools a bit, but I don't mind. I'm used to it. Try eating something, Stella says. That always makes you happy. I eat an old brown carrot. It doesn't help. But I don't tell Stella. She needs to sleep. You could try remembering a good day, Stella suggests. That's what I do when I can't sleep. Stella remembers every moment since she was born, every scent, every sunset, every slight, every victory. You know I can't remember much, I say. There's a difference, Stella says gently, between can't remember and won't remember. That's true, I admit. Not remembering can be difficult, but I've had a lot of time to work on it. Memories are precious, Stella adds. They help tell us who we are. Try remembering all your keepers. You always liked Carl, the one with the harmonica. Carl, yes. I remember how he gave me a coconut when I was still a juvenile. It took me all day to open it. <clears throat> I try to recall other keepers I have known. The humans who cleaned my domain and prepared my food and sometimes kept me company. There was Juan, who poured Pepsis into my waiting mouth, and Katrina, who used to poke me with a broom when I was asleep, and Ellen, who sang, How much is that monkey in the window, with a sad smile while she scrubbed my water bowl. And there was Gerald, who once brought me a box of fat, sweet strawberries. Gerald was my favorite keeper. I haven't had a real keeper in a long time. Max says he doesn't have the money to pay for an ape babysitter. These days... George cleans my cage, and Mac is the one who feeds me. When I think about all the people who have taken care of me, mostly it's Mac I recall, day in and day out, year after year. Mac who bought me and raised me and says I'm no longer cute. As if a silverback could ever be cute. Moonlight falls on the frozen carousel, on the silent popcorn stand, on the stall of the leather belts that smell like long-gone cows. The heavy work of Stella's breathing sounds like the wind in trees, and I wait for sleep to find me. Mac gives me a black crayon and a fresh pile of paper. It's time to work again. 
I smell the crayon, roll it in my hands, press the sharp point against my palm. There's nothing I love more than a new crayon. I search my domain for something to draw. What is black? An old banana peel would work, but I've eaten them all. Not tag is brown. My little pool is blue. The yogurt raisin I'm saving for that afternoon is white, at least on the outside. Something moves in the corner. I have a visitor. A shiny beetle has stopped by. Bugs often wander through my domain on their way to somewhere else. Hello, beetle, I say. He freezes. Silent. Bugs never want to chat. The beetle's an attractive bug with a body like a glossy nut. He's black as a starless night. That's it. I'll draw him. It's hard making a picture of something new. I don't get the chance that often, but I try. I look at the beetle, who's being kind enough not to move, then back at my paper. I draw his body, his legs, his little antennae, his sour expression. I'm lucky. The beetle stays all day. Usually bugs don't linger when they visit. I'm beginning to wonder if he's feeling all right. Bob, who's been known to munch on bugs from time to time, offers to eat him. I tell Bob that won't be necessary. I'm just finishing my last picture when Mac returns. George and Julie are with him. Mac enters my domain and picks up a drawing. What the heck is this? he asks. Beats me what Ivan thinks he's drawn. This is a picture of nothing. A big black nothing. Julie is standing just outside my domain. Can I see? She asks. Mac holds my picture up to the window. Julia tilts her head, squeezes one eye shut, and then she opens her eye and scans my domain. I know, she exclaims. It's a beetle. You see that beetle over there by Ivan's pool? Man, I just sprayed this plate for bugs. Mac walks over the beetle and lifts his foot. Before Mac can stop, the beetle skittles, skitters away, disappearing through a crack in the wall. Mac turns back to my drawings. So you figure this is a beetle, huh? Well, if you say so, kid. Oh, that's a beetle for sure, Julie says, smiling at me. I know a beetle when I see one. It's nice, I think, having a fellow artist around. And on page 59, we have a little picture of a beetle. Stella is the first to notice the change, but soon we all feel it. A new animal is coming to the Big Top Mall. How do we know this? Well, because we listen, we watch, and most of all, we sniff the air. Humans always smell odd when change is in the air. Like rotten meat with a hint of papaya. Bob fears our new neighbor will be a giant cat with slitted eyes and a coiled tail. But Stella says a truck will arrive this afternoon carrying a baby elephant. How do you know? I ask. I sample the air, but all I smell is caramel corn. I love caramel corn. I can hear, Stella says. She's crying for her mother. I listen. I hear the cars charging past. I hear the snore of the sun bears in their wire domain. But I don't hear any elephants. You're just hoping, I say. Stella closes her eyes. No, she says. Not hoping. Not at all. My TV is off, so while we wait for the neighbor, I ask Stella to tell us a story. Stella rubs her right foot against the wall. Her foot is swollen again and ugly deep red. If you're not feeling well, Stella, I say, you could take a nap and tell us a story later. I'm fine, she says, and she carefully shifts her weight. Tell us the Jumbo story, I say. It's a favorite of mine, but I don't think Bob has ever heard it. Because she remembers everything, Stella knows many stories. I like colorful tales with black beginnings and stormy middles and cloudless blue sky endings. But any story will do. I'm not in a position to be picky. Once upon a time, Stella begins, there was a human boy. He was visiting a gorilla family at a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Bob asks. He's a street smart dog, but there's much he hasn't seen. A good zoo, Stella says, is a large domain, a wild cage, a safe place to be. It is room to roam and humans who don't hurt. She pauses, considering her words. A good zoo is how humans make amends. 
Stella moves a bit, groaning softly. The boy stood on a wall, she continues, watching, pointing, but he lost his balance and fell into the cage. Humans are clumsy, I interrupt. If only they would knuckle wall and then wouldn't topple so often. Stella nods. A good point, Ivan. In any case, the boy lay in a motionless heap while the humans gasped and cried. The silverback, whose name was Jumbo, examined the boy as, his was, as was his duty, while his troop watched from a safe distance. Jumbo stroked the child gently. He smelled the boy's pain and then stood watch. When the boy awoke, his humans cried out, Stay still! Stay still! Don't move! Because they were certain, humans are always certain about things, that Jumbo would crush the boy's life from him. The boy moaned. The crowd waited, hushed, expecting the worst. Jumbo led his troop away. Men came down on ropes and whisked the child to waiting arms. Was the boy all right? Bob asks. He wasn't hurt, Stella says. Although, I wouldn't be surprised if his parents hugged him many times that night, in between their scoldings. Bob, who has been chewing his tail, pauses, tilting his head. Is this a true story? I always tell the truth, Stella replies although I sometimes confuse the facts. Thank you guys, and keep reading!